Would you like free audiobooks? Click the link in the description. Question 1. A 55-year-old male patient with a history of type 2 diabetes mellitus presents with complaints of blurred vision and dizziness. His current medications include metformin and simvastatin. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? A. Check the patient's blood glucose level. B. Administer a dose of simvastatin. C. Provide a carbohydrate snack. D. Assess the patient's blood pressure. Answer. A. Check the patient's blood glucose level. Rationale. In a diabetic patient presenting with symptoms of blurred vision and dizziness, the first priority is to assess for hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia by checking the blood glucose level. This immediate action can identify a potentially life-threatening condition that requires urgent intervention. Question 2. A nurse is caring for a post-operative patient who has just returned from surgery with a prescription for morphine sulfate for pain management. The patient is currently asleep, and upon assessment, the nurse notes a respiratory rate of 8 breaths per minute. What is the nurse's best course of action? A. Wake the patient and administer the morphine. B. Administer naloxone. C. Reassess the patient's respiratory rate in 15 minutes. D. Hold the morphine and notify the physician. Answer. D. Hold the morphine and notify the physician. Rationale. A respiratory rate of 8 breaths per minute indicates respiratory depression, a contraindication for administering additional opioids like morphine. The nurse should hold the medication and immediately notify the physician for further instructions, prioritizing the patient's respiratory status. Question 3. A patient with congestive heart failure is exhibiting signs of fluid overload. Which nursing intervention is most appropriate to address this condition? A. Restrict fluid intake to 1 liter per day. B. Encourage ambulation 3 times a day. C. Administer prescribed diuretics. D. Increase dietary sodium intake. Answer. C. Administer prescribed diuretics. Rationale. In patients with congestive heart failure and signs of fluid overload, administering prescribed diuretics is the most appropriate intervention to remove excess fluid from the body, relieve symptoms, and prevent further complications. Question 4. A nurse is preparing to administer a blood transfusion to a patient. Which of the following actions is the most critical to perform before initiating the transfusion? A. Verify the patient's identity with two identifiers. B. Premedicate the patient with an antipyretic. C. Ensure that the intravenous line is flushed with normal saline. D. Check the patient's temperature. Answer. A. Verify the patient's identity with two identifiers. Rationale, the most critical step before initiating a blood transfusion is to verify the patient's identity using two identifiers, e.g., name and date of birth. This action prevents transfusion errors and ensures patient safety. Question 5. A patient is admitted with severe abdominal pain and a suspected diagnosis of appendicitis. Which of the following nursing assessments is most important to perform initially? A. Palpate the abdomen for tenderness. B. Assess the patient's bowel sounds. C. Measure the patient's temperature. D. Ask about the location and onset of pain. Answer. D. Ask about the location and onset of pain. Rationale. In a patient with severe abdominal pain and suspected appendicitis, the most important initial assessment is to ask about the location and onset of pain. This information helps in determining the likelihood of appendicitis and guides further diagnostic testing and intervention. Question 6. A patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is experiencing shortness of breath. The nurse has available oxygen via nasal cannula and a nebulizer treatment prescribed. What should the nurse do first? A. Administer the nebulizer treatment. B. Increase the oxygen flow rate. C. Assess the patient's oxygen saturation. D. 
Encourage the patient to perform pursed lip breathing. Answer. C. Assess the patient's oxygen saturation. Rationale. The first action the nurse should take for a COPD patient experiencing shortness of breath is to assess the oxygen saturation. This measurement will guide the appropriate intervention, whether it's administering oxygen, a nebulizer treatment, or employing breathing techniques. Question 7. A nurse is providing education to a patient with hypertension. Which statement by the patient indicates a need for further teaching? A. I should monitor my blood pressure at home regularly. B. I can add salt to my meals as long as I drink enough water. C. I will need to take my medication even if I'm feeling well. D. I should incorporate exercise into my daily routine. Answer, B. I can add salt to my meals as long as I drink enough water. Rationale. This statement indicates a misunderstanding about hypertension management. Patients with hypertension should be advised to limit sodium intake, as excessive salt can contribute to increased blood pressure levels. This indicates a need for further education on dietary restrictions. Question 8. A nurse is caring for a patient who suddenly becomes agitated and confused. The patient's heart rate is elevated, and they are sweating profusely. What is the nurse's priority action? A. Administer an antipsychotic medication. B. Perform a thorough physical assessment. C. Restrain the patient for their safety. D. Attempt to calm the patient by speaking in a soothing voice. Answer. B. Perform a thorough physical assessment. Rationale. The nurse's priority is to perform a thorough physical assessment to identify the underlying cause of the patient's sudden change in mental status and physiological signs. This could indicate a range of issues, from infection to adverse medication effects, and guides appropriate intervention. Question 9. A pediatric patient with a severe peanut allergy accidentally ingests a product containing peanuts and starts exhibiting signs of anaphylaxis. The nurse immediately administers epinephrine as prescribed. What is the next best step? A. Reassure the child and wait for the epinephrine to take effect. B. Prepare to administer a second dose of epinephrine if needed. C. Give the child an antihistamine to reduce symptoms. D. Monitor the child's vital signs and oxygen saturation continuously. Answer, D. Monitor the child's vital signs and oxygen saturation continuously. Rationale, after administering epinephrine for anaphylaxis, the next best step is to continuously monitor the child's vital signs and oxygen saturation. This monitoring is crucial to assess the child's response to the treatment and to identify any need for further intervention. Question 10. A patient with a history of atrial fibrillation is on warfarin therapy. The nurse notes the patient's INR is significantly higher than the therapeutic range. What is the most appropriate nursing action? A. Administer the next dose of warfarin as scheduled. B. Prepare to administer vitamin K. C. Increase the patient's intake of green leafy vegetables. D. Obtain a repeat INR to confirm the initial results. Answer. B. Prepare to administer vitamin K. Rationale. An INR significantly higher than the therapeutic range indicates a risk of bleeding due to overanticoagulation. The most appropriate action is to prepare to administer vitamin K which can help reverse the effects of warfarin and reduce the risk of bleeding. Question 11. A nurse is caring for a patient who reports nausea after undergoing chemotherapy. Which of the following interventions should the nurse prioritize? A. Offer the patient a glass of water. B. Administer prescribed antiemetic medication. C. Encourage the patient to rest in a supine position. D. Provide the patient with a high-fiber meal. Answer. B. Administer prescribed antiemetic medication. Rationale. Nausea is a common side effect of chemotherapy. 
The priority nursing intervention for a patient reporting nausea post-chemotherapy is to administer prescribed antiemetic medication to alleviate the symptom and prevent vomiting, which can lead to further complications. Question 12. A patient is admitted with acute exacerbation of asthma. The nurse notes wheezing and difficulty breathing. Which action should the nurse take first? A. Administer a short-acting beta agonist by a nebulizer. B. Perform chest physiotherapy. C. Start oxygen therapy at 2 liters per minute. D. Encourage the patient to use pursed lip breathing. Answer. A. Administer a short-acting beta agonist by a nebulizer. Rationale. In an acute exacerbation of asthma, the first priority is to relieve airway constriction and improve breathing. Administering a short-acting beta agonist by a nebulizer is the most effective immediate intervention to achieve this. Question 13. A nurse is assessing a patient with suspected deep vein thrombosis, DVT, in the lower leg. Which of the following findings would be most indicative of DVT? A. Warmth and redness over the affected area. B. Decreased calf circumference compared to the other leg. C. Absence of pedal pulses. D. Coldness and pallor of the affected leg. Answer. A. Warmth and redness over the affected area. Rationale. Warmth and redness over the affected area, along with swelling and pain, are classic signs of deep vein thrombosis. These symptoms occur due to inflammation and clot formation in the deep veins. Question 14. A nurse is planning care for a patient with dehydration. Which of the following outcomes should be the priority? A. The patient will consume at least 75% of each meal. B. The patient's skin turgor will return to normal. C. The patient will express feelings of increased energy. D. The patient will have a urinary output of at least 30 milliliters per hour. Answer. D. The patient will have a urinary output of at least 30 milliliters per hour. Rationale. For a patient with dehydration, the priority outcome is to ensure adequate hydration status which can be measured by urinary output. A urinary output of at least 30 milliliters per hour indicates adequate kidney function and fluid balance. Question 15. A nurse is caring for a patient who is postoperative day one following abdominal surgery. The patient refuses to use the incentive spirometer due to pain. What is the best response by the nurse? A. It's okay to skip it if you're in too much pain. B. Using the incentive spirometer will prevent complications like pneumonia. C. I'll give you pain medication after you use the incentive spirometer. D. You don't have to use it if you can take deep breaths and cough effectively. Answer. B. Using the incentive spirometer will prevent complications like pneumonia. Rationale. Educating the patient about the importance of using the incentive spirometer postoperatively, especially to prevent pulmonary complications like pneumonia, is essential. This may motivate the patient to use the device despite the pain, emphasizing the importance of pain management strategies to facilitate its use. Question 16. A nurse is preparing to teach a patient with newly diagnosed diabetes mellitus about managing their condition. Which teaching method is most effective? A. Providing written materials only. B. Lecturing on the importance of glucose control. C. Demonstrating how to check blood glucose and letting the patient practice. D. Advising the patient to join a diabetes support group. Answer. C. Demonstrating how to check blood glucose and letting the patient practice. Rationale. Demonstrating how to check blood glucose and allowing the patient to practice provides hands-on experience, enhancing learning and retention. This method is effective in teaching self-management skills for diabetes care. Question 17. A patient with bipolar disorder is experiencing a manic episode. Which nursing intervention is most appropriate? A. 
Engage the patient in group therapy sessions to improve social skills. B. Provide a quiet environment and limit stimulation. C. Encourage the patient to take on leadership roles in communal activities. D. Increase the frequency of family visits to enhance support. Answer. B. Provide a quiet environment and limit stimulation. Rationale. During a manic episode, a patient with bipolar disorder may be easily overwhelmed by external stimuli. Providing a quiet and minimally stimulating environment can help reduce agitation and prevent escalation of symptoms. Question 18. A nurse is assessing a patient who reports feeling anxious. Which of the following findings should the nurse recognize as a physiological manifestation of anxiety? A. Bradycardia. B. Hypotension. C. Diaphoresis. D. Decreased respiratory rate. Answer, C. Diaphoresis. Rationale, diaphoresis, excessive sweating, is a common physiological response to anxiety, as the sympathetic nervous system is activated. Other manifestations might include tachycardia, hypertension, and increased respiratory rate, rather than the decreases mentioned in the other options. Question 19. A nurse is caring for a patient receiving intravenous antibiotics. The patient complains of pain at the intravenous site, which appears red and swollen. What is the first action the nurse should take? A. Apply a warm compress to the site. B. Discontinue the intravenous infusion immediately. C. Administer a prescribed analgesic. D. Slow the rate of the infusion. Answer, B. Discontinue the intravenous infusion immediately. Rationale, pain, redness, and swelling at an intravenous site may indicate phlebitis or infiltration. The first action should be to discontinue the intravenous infusion to prevent further tissue damage. Then, assess the site further and possibly start a new intravenous line at a different site. Question 20. A nurse is planning care for a patient at risk for falls. Which intervention is most effective in preventing falls in a hospital setting? A. Keeping the bed in the highest position. B. Using restraints when the patient is alone. C. Ensuring the patient's footwear has non-slip soles. D. Administering sedatives regularly to prevent wandering. Answer. C. Ensuring the patient's footwear has non-slip soles. Rationale. Providing non-slip footwear is a key intervention to prevent falls by enhancing stability and traction. Keeping the environment safe and promoting the use of assistive devices as needed are also important strategies. Question 21. A nurse is caring for a patient who has been fasting for 12 hours in preparation for a scheduled surgery. The patient reports feeling lightheaded and dizzy. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? A. Offer the patient a glass of water. B. Check the patient's blood glucose level. C. Inform the surgeon about the patient's symptoms. D. Help the patient to lie down and elevate their legs. Answer, D. Help the patient to lie down and elevate their legs. Rationale, when a patient reports feeling lightheaded and dizzy, especially after fasting, the first priority is to prevent injury from potential falls. Helping the patient to lie down and elevating their legs can improve cerebral perfusion by promoting venous return, addressing the symptoms of orthostatic hypotension immediately. Question 22. A nurse is developing a plan of care for a patient with severe anxiety related to an upcoming surgery. Which intervention should the nurse include to help manage the patient's anxiety? A. Schedule the surgery as early in the morning as possible. B. Limit the amount of information provided about the surgery to avoid overwhelming the patient. C. Teach relaxation techniques and deep breathing exercises. D. Encourage the patient to avoid discussing fears to reduce anxiety. Answer, C. Teach relaxation techniques and deep breathing exercises. 
Rationale, teaching relaxation techniques and deep breathing exercises is an effective intervention for managing anxiety. These techniques can help the patient gain a sense of control over their anxiety by focusing on calming exercises, which can be particularly beneficial in the preoperative period. Question 23. A patient with chronic kidney disease is undergoing hemodialysis and has a restricted fluid intake. The nurse notes that the patient's weight has increased by 2 kilograms since the last dialysis session. What is the most appropriate nursing action? A. Encourage the patient to drink more fluids to stay hydrated. B. Assess for signs of fluid overload and edema. C. Adjust the dialysis machine to remove extra fluid more rapidly. D. Instruct the patient to limit fluid intake further. Answer. B. Assess for signs of fluid overload and edema. Rationale. In a patient undergoing hemodialysis with a restricted fluid intake, a weight gain of 2 kg likely indicates fluid retention. The nurse should first assess for signs of fluid overload and edema to confirm fluid accumulation and then communicate these findings to the healthcare team for potential adjustments in dialysis settings. Question 24. A nurse is providing discharge instructions to a patient who has been prescribed warfarin. Which dietary advice is most important for the nurse to emphasize? A. Increase intake of vitamin K-rich foods like green leafy vegetables. B. Avoid grapefruit and grapefruit juice while taking warfarin. C. Maintain a consistent intake of vitamin K-rich foods. D. Eliminate all vitamin K from the diet to prevent blood clots. Answer. C. Maintain a consistent intake of vitamin K-rich foods. Rationale. For patients taking warfarin, it is crucial to maintain a consistent intake of vitamin K-rich foods as vitamin K can affect the efficacy of the medication. Sudden changes in dietary vitamin K can lead to fluctuations in INR levels, potentially causing either an increased risk of bleeding or thrombosis. Education about consistent dietary habits helps manage the therapeutic effects of warfarin effectively. Question 25. A nurse is preparing to administer a subcutaneous injection to a thin, elderly patient. Which site and technique should the nurse select to minimize the risk of injury? A. The dorsogluteal site, using a 90-degree angle. B. The ventrogluteal site, using a 45-degree angle. C. The abdominal site, using a 45-degree angle. D. The deltoid site, using a 90-degree angle. Answer. C. The abdominal site, using a 45-degree angle. Rationale, for thin, elderly patients, the abdominal site is preferred for subcutaneous injections due to the presence of adequate subcutaneous fat, which can absorb the medication effectively. Using a 45-degree angle helps ensure the medication is delivered to the subcutaneous tissue, minimizing the risk of muscle or nerve damage, especially important in patients with decreased muscle mass. Visit nursestudy.net for more nursing practice exams, care plans, and study guides.